As many of you know, our very special guest is a world-renowned pediatrician, founder and CEO of the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco, author and leading thinker around adverse childhood experiences. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute honor to welcome to Scotland and to introduce Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Hello. Good afternoon. Whew. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be here. And uh, I have to say, this is my first time in Scotland. And you guys are blowing me away. What you all are doing here around adverse childhood experiences, the way you all are coming together to make Scotland the first ACE-aware nation, it's absolutely remarkable. And I am just grateful and humbled that I have the opportunity to be here to share this with you. Now, adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress is, um, they're my, my favorite thing to think about, talk about, study, research. And the reason is because, although many people, when we think about childhood adversity, it feels scary and it feels sad and it feels awful, for me, understanding this science was absolutely life-changing, and it feels fundamentally hopeful. So I came to this work now a little over a decade ago in my role as a pediatrician. And uh, when I finished my residency training at Stanford, I wanted to be someplace where I felt needed. I wanted to do work where I felt like I was helping those who perhaps maybe didn't have enough people to help them. And so I opened a clinic in one of San Francisco's poorest and most underserved neighborhoods, a place called Bayview Hunters Point. And as I set about doing my pediatric practice, what I found was that over and over again, folks were uh, referring to me kids who, had, um, uh, who were having behavior problems, right? And they said, Dr. Burke, because this was before I got married, can you please see Bobby? Bobby's hitting the kid next to him. He, he can't sit still. He's, you know, he's falling apart in class. Please, Dr. Burke, he's got ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Please, can you put him on some Ritalin? And I said, sure, send him down. I, I'll see him. And when I did what I was trained to do, right, when I did a thorough history and physical exam, what I found was that for most of my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of attention deficit because most of my patients had such a severe history of adversity that it just seemed like there was something else going on. In fact, you know, as a doctor, and anyone who works with me will tell you that I am a very by-the-book, letter-of-the-law, hardcore, you know, data nerd researcher. Right? So when I looked at the diagnostic criteria for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, right, it listed all of the symptoms that my patients were having. Right? Poor impulse control, they're acting out, you know, t terrible behavior. But on the last line of the manual, and at the time it was the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 4th edition, the DSM-4, it said, and these problems are not caused by any other mental health disorder. 
Well, I'm not a mental health practitioner. I'm a doctor, I'm a pediatrician. But I thought to myself, what if it isn't another mental health disorder, but a biological process that is affecting these kids? Because it wasn't just their behavior. I'll never forget, I saw a, a girl, a 10-year-old girl, who came to see me and she had terrible asthma. And I had given her powerful medications to try to keep her asthma at bay and keep her out of the hospital. And I remember sitting down with her mom again to go over her asthma triggers, right? What could it be? Could it be, you know, uh, pet dander? Could it be uh, dust or could it be pollen or cleaning products? What could it be that we hadn't already looked at that could be activating this girl's asthma? And you know what her mother said to me? I will never forget. She said, you know, doctora, I noticed that my daughter's asthma tends to act up every time her dad punches a hole in the wall. And so for me, I began connecting the dots. And that is what led me to the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Now, I know many of you in this room are familiar, but for those who aren't, we remember that the ACE study, which was done by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and Kaiser Permanente, a major healthcare giant in the US, uh, what they did was they looked, they asked 17 and a half thousand adults about their history of 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. These include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and, and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent uh, was substance dependent, had mental illness, uh, where they were incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. And for every yes, for every one of these someone had, you'd get a point on your ACE score. And then what they did was look at the association between ACEs and health outcomes. And what they found was striking. Two things. The first thing was that a whole bunch of people had ACEs. So in this Kaiser CDC uh, data, almost two thirds of the folks had at least one adverse childhood experience, and one in eight folks had four or more adverse childhood experiences. In the US today, that translates into 34 million children who have been exposed to ACEs. When we look across ethnic groups in the US, we see that adverse childhood experiences aren't confined to one group or another, right? That there's very similar uh, rates of ACEs ac across whites, blacks, Hispanics, uh, Asians, and Pacific Islanders. Every ethnic group is affected. And here in the UK, what we see with the Wales ACE study is that Almost half of folks have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience, and 14% have experienced four or more ACEs. The second thing that they found in the ACE study was that the higher your ACEs, the greater your risk of health problems. In the United States, having four or more adverse childhood experiences is associated with dramatically, not a little bit, dramatic increase for seven out of 10 of, of the leading causes of death. And globally, ACEs are associated with a dramatic increase in six out of 10 of the leading causes of death, right? And when we're talking about um, dramatic increase, I mean, we're talking about double the risk for heart disease, the number one killer in the world, two and a half times the risk of stroke, three times the risk of chronic lung disease. Now, why am I talking about all of these things other than the fact that, that I'm a doctor, right? And I really see it as my job to prevent all of these things. But the other reason I'm talking about all of these things is that, guess what? This stuff is expensive. And you know what? I want that money. That money that we are spending to treat heart disease and stroke and chronic lung disease and diabetes, when we're talking about prevention programs, 
right? We're talking about reducing smoking and improving diet, but we're not talking about ACEs. And when it comes, what, what we know, when it comes to the data and the science, is that ACEs are a major driver of the leading causes of death in the world. How about we use even a fraction of the money that we're spending on all of these health outcomes and put those dollars into prevention, right? But in order to figure out how to prevent ACEs, we have to figure out um, how it happens, right? Because when it comes to, you know, we talk about this in terms of healthcare costs, in terms of morbidity and mortality, and we see that for individuals who have very high ACEs, without intervention, there is an increase, uh, th there's almost a 20 year difference in life expectancy. But the real issue is about quality of life, right? What does it mean for every young person that's, that's growing up? How do we make the nation that we're in a great place to grow up for kids? So in order to be able to answer that question, we need to understand how this works, right? Because anytime we're trying to interrupt a process, we have to break it down and understand what are the pieces so that we can figure out where are the targets for intervention. Now, at first, folks thought, oh, we know this ACE thing, right? If you have a rough childhood, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do drugs, and that's the stuff that, that really ruins your health, right? This is not about science. This is about bad behavior. And if you look at the data, you would think those folks are right. Because if you look at the prevalence of smoking by ACEs, this is from the CDC data, right? The higher the, the, the ACE, ACEs, the higher your rate of smoking, higher your rate of alcoholism, higher your rate of uh, te teen pregnancy, teen paternity, and early intercourse, right? So you would think, yes, of course, right? This is about bad behavior. Unless you think that this is just about Americans making bad choices, because we have been making some bad choices lately. <laughs> um, uh, when we look at the whales ACE data, we see the same thing, right? The higher your ACE rate, the higher risk of smoking, high risk drinking, poor diet, early sexual initiation, teen pregnancy, heroin and crack use, every single time we see that dose response relationship, right? And so people thought, oh, we know what this ACEs thing is all about. It's about bad behavior. And we just need to tell those people to not engage in that bad behavior. And that's what it's about. Well, fortunately, some really smart scientists decided to put that to the test. And it turns out, right? that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you still have increased health risk. In fact, bad behavior only accounts for about 50% about of the health risk from ACEs. Well, what gives? How does that work, right? How is it that if you have lots of ACEs and you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't have a terrible diet, you're still at increased risk for health problems? And that is where me and my team decided to do a, a deep dive into how early adversity leads to disease and early death. Because when we unpack that mechanism, when we know the science of how that works, it gives us more tools than we've ever had before to be able to beat this. And I wanna give you an example of what I'm talking about. So in the early 80s, right, uh, people were coming into the emergency department, doctors were seeing folks, and uh, they'd see all these folks, and they were having very high rates of tuberculosis, right? And doctors said, oh, tuberculosis, we know about that. So we're going to write you the prescription, give you the prescription, send them out. And then other folks were coming in, and they had very high rates of pneumonia. They said, oh, 
pneumonia. But it wasn't any pneumonia. It was a very rare pneumonia called pneumocystis pneumonia. And they said, pneumocystis, okay. It's a little uncommon. I got to look it up. But we know how to treat that. So we'd write the prescription and send them out. And then they were coming in with these rare skin lesions, right? This very rare type of skin cancer called Kaposi sarcoma. And they said, boy, you know what? That's, I don't know how to treat that. I'm going to have to refer you to a colleague, right? But I know my colleague knows how to treat it. So once I write the referral, my job is done. And what do you think happened? Folks kept on coming back. And when they came back, they were sicker and sicker and sicker. Because that pneumonia, that TB, that skin cancer, we thought that was the problem that we needed to treat. And it turns out that wasn't the problem. Those were just symptoms of an underlying problem that we were not even beginning to touch. And that underlying problem was a virus that was compromising the very immune system, HIV. And once we figured that out, right? It's a virus. Oh, wait, no, it's not just a virus. It's a retrovirus. Okay, we have to figure out how to treat this retrovirus, right? And once we figured out how it worked and how to interrupt that mechanism, what do you think happened? The death rate from HIV AIDS plummeted because we figured out how to address the root cause instead of just looking at the surface symptoms. So when it comes to adverse childhood experiences, I'm going to take a second to talk about the biology of adversity, right? To understand the root cause so that we can develop the same type of highly targeted and effective interventions so that we can see dramatic I'm not talking about a little bit. Dramatic improvements in the outcomes for individuals who have experienced ACEs. So how does it work? Now, for those of you who have seen me speak before, don't give it away. You're walking in the forest, and you see that guy, right? What happens? What happens in our brains and bodies? Immediately, our amygdala in our brain sounds the alarm, right? And it activates our bodies to release a ton of stress hormones, adrenaline, and cortisol. So our hearts begin to pound. Our pupils dilate. Our airways open up, right? We shunt blood to our big muscles for running and jumping. And away from that itty bitty muscle that holds your bladder closed so you may pee your pants, right? <laughs> but you are ready. You are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. But if you were to think about it, fighting a bear wouldn't seem like a good idea, would it? No, because he's big, he's got teeth, he's got claws, look at him, right? And that is why when our stress response is activated, Right? That amygdala alarm sends a signal to our prefrontal cortex. It's the part of the brain responsible for judgment and impulse control and executive functioning. And it turns it way, way down. Because the last thing that you want when you're in the forest and a bear is impulse control getting in the way of survival. Right? And instead, what it does is it turns up a part of the brain called the noradrenergic nucleus of the locus ceruleus, or as I like to call it, the part of the brain responsible for, I don't know karate, but I do know karate, right? <laughs> this is the, the uh, within the brain stress response, and it gets us amped up, right? Think of the uh, Rangers versus the Celtics game, right? <laughs> and the less obvious thing that happens when we activate our stress response is that it also activates our immune system. Because if that bear gets his claws into you, you want your immune system to be primed, 
to bring inflammation, to stabilize that wound so that you can live long enough to either beat that bear or get away. When you think about it, it's brilliant. This system was evolved over millennia to save our lives from a mortal threat. And in fact, the animals that didn't evolve this mechanism, well, they didn't live to reproduce. But the problem is what happens when that bear, oops, when that bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health damaging. And what we see is that for kids who have been exposed to high doses of adversity, we see changes in the way the brain develops and organizes. We see long-term changes to the stress response, where you have an overactive stress response that has a hard time turning itself off. We see an overactive fear response. We see changes in brain structure and function that can interfere with learning. And I'm gonna pause for a minute on this next piece. Changes to brain biology that lead to increased risk for addiction and high-risk behavior. Now, you know, I, I told you guys I'm a little bit of a science nerd. I try not to do too, ma too many of the medical terms, but I'm gonna take a second to talk about a part of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. It is the pleasure and reward center of the brain, right? And it's activated by cocaine, methamphetamine, alcohol, tobacco, sex, gambling, high sugar, high fat foods. Also interestingly, activated by altruism, right? It is the part of the brain that when we do things that feel so good, that maybe we shouldn't do quite so much of, that's the part of the brain that's activated. And exposure to high doses of adversity can actually lead to changes in the structure and function of the reward center of the brain, which is part of what leads to the increased risk for substance dependence, right? So you remember a couple slides ago when I was talking about Oh, those folks, they do these bad things, right? They're more likely to smoke and more likely to overeat and more likely to use substances and more likely to engage in high-risk behavior and early pregnancy. That's not just because they make bad choices. It's not just because of their environments. And, 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 and we recognize that, yes, people are more likely to do the, the things that they see in the environments around them, but they're also neurobiologically more vulnerable to becoming dependent on substances, right? And that's critically important to know. So the concept of telling folks to just say no or just to do something different, when they don't even recognize that they may, may be at higher risk, right? That's not fair. Now, when we talk about the impact of ACEs, Right? And a lot of the times, one of the things that kind of drives me nuts is that we have the conversation and it kind of, it stops at the neck. As if somehow the brain and the rest of the body are two working in two totally different places. But we can't forget about the rest of the body. So we also see long-term changes to the function of the immune system, which leads to increased risk of infections, inflammation, and chronic diseases. We also see long-term changes to hormones that can lead to changes in growth, changes in puberty, and changes in metabolism, which we believe may be part of why we see an increased risk of being overweight or obese. And ultimately, one of the questions I've always wondered is, okay, I get it. You have a rough childhood. You have an overactive stress response, right? But what about... When you leave the house, leave that home, I mean, heart disease and stroke, Alzheimer's, those things don't happen to you until you're old, right? So why can't those folks just, um, you know, straighten up and fly right? And uh, how is it that they're still 
having these health effects? Well, it turns out that what happens to us in childhood and the way that we see these long-term effects is that our environments actually change the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Right? Back in the day, we used to ask, is it nature or is it nurture? And scientists, fortunately, have finally put that question to bed. We know that, it's, that our environment determines how our DNA is expressed in something called epigenetic regulation. If you think about your, your DNA, your, ge your genetic code, as notes, musical notes on a page, your epigenetic regulation is like the musical notations. They kind of tell your body how loudly or quietly to play a certain piece of DNA, if that makes sense. Sometimes you might repeat a section, or sometimes uh, you might skip the whole next section altogether. Uh, these musical notations of epigenetic regulation, right, are written by our environments. So when we now understand, right, that early adversity, right, filtered through predisposed vulnerability, so some folks are genetically more vulnerable, but also buffered by protective factors. We know that safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments are protective for children, but without those adequate protective factors, we see long-term changes to the brain and the neurologic system, our immune system, our hormonal systems, and ultimately, that happens through the way our DNA is read and transcribed. All of these changes are what is now known as a toxic stress response. And one of the things, I'm just going to make a quick note here, right? When we talk about toxic stress, and you all are the choir, you all are the ones who are leading the ACES movement in Scotland. So I'm going to take it just one second to say this. When we talk about toxic stress, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the biological process. Toxic stress is something that happens in the body. If I hear one more time, oh my God, the line at Starbucks was too long, right? It was toxic stress, <laughs> right? It's not, it's not the stressor, it's the biological stress response. And that's really critical for us to understand. But when we now understand, right, that this is a biological process, then we can begin to think about how we take action to intervene in this process. All right. So now we know what's going on. What the heck do we do about it? In our center, one of the first things that we did was we actually looked at our uh, medical charts for our patients. And we said, you know what? How much is this really even an issue for our kids? Well, it turns out that when we looked in our medical charts, and we hadn't even been asking, right? But we found that we had documented in our medical charts that two-thirds of our patients had experienced at least one ACE, and 12%, one in eight, had experienced four or more ACEs. And when we did the analysis, what we found is that our kids who had four or more ACEs were twice as likely to be overweight or obese and 32 times as likely to have learning and behavior problems in school as our kids with zero ACEs. 32 times. When the statistician from Stanford who we worked with called me to tell me these numbers, I felt this incredible mix of emotion, right? Because at, at the same time, I felt this incredible heartbreak for these kids who had been told that they were the problem, right? That they had terrible behavior, that they just needed to change the way that they were behaving, right? When this data, is telling us what we were seeing was a result of a toxic 
level of exposure to adversity, right? The stress is toxic, not our children. But the second thing that it told us, and I almost missed it, right? Because we're working in this incredibly vulnerable population, that if our kids had zero ACEs, and these were low-income kids, bl mostly black and brown kids, in San Francisco, if they had zero ACEs, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. Right? And so that was also profoundly important in terms of telling us what do we do. It's critical that we as a society try to keep as many kids as possible in that, in that zero level as opposed to letting kids uh, accumulate ACEs. Now, one of the things that was really critical for us and for me as a doctor is that why is this information important? Well, for all these kids that folks thought they had ADHD, what's the number one treatment for ADHD? The number one treatment. Oh, come on, someone's got to say it. Drugs, that's right. Stimulants, Ritalin, Adderall, Stratera, right? Stimulants. And this is why the science is so important. If we look at the function of the prefrontal cortex, right, the part that's necessary for executive functioning, relative to stress hormones, what we see is it looks like this. It's an inverted U. If you don't have enough um, stress hormones, you can't function. You can't pay attention. I wouldn't be able to give this speech right now if I wasn't a little bit nervous when I was backstage, right? And that is the reason why stimulants are the number one treatment. So you give stimulants, and there you go, up the curve, improved executive functioning. But wait a minute. Does it make a difference if that poor executive functioning, right, is because you're on the other side of the curve? Because you got way too much stress hormones pumping in your body, and you have impaired executive functioning because your amygdala is telling your prefrontal cortex, don't pay attention to the teacher, you need to be thinking about survival, right? In that case, you add more stimulants, and what do you think happens? It doesn't help. In that case, the treatment is number one, to reduce the dose of adversity. Number two, to enhance the capacity of the caregivers in that child's life to be a buffer to their stress. And number three, yeah, there are some kids who do need medication, but when we give them medications, we actually use a medication that was originally developed as a blood pressure lowering medication. And the, the, what the medicine does is it actually helps to regulate the functioning of the stress response, right? Understanding the science makes a difference. And in our center, what we found is that the symptoms of toxic stress are identifiable as early as infancy. Those kids who are having the behavior problems, those kids who look like ADHD, there are times that, believe it or not, I wonder if they're the lucky ones. Because they're the ones where the teacher calls it out and says, I can't take this child's behavior anymore. There's something going on, and they send them to me. But what about the kids? Many kids don't ever have any behavioral problems, right? And those kids are suffering in silence, but they're still at increased risk for health problems. So one of the things that we need to be able to recognize is that sometimes it doesn't show up as acting out. Sometimes it shows up as asthma. Sometimes it shows up as tummy aches. Sometimes it shows up as increased infection. So what we know about the science is that early identification and intervention are absolutely critical. I want to tell you what that looks like a little bit in the healthcare space, and then I'm going to show you what it looks like outside of our clinic, right? So what we know about the healing power of connection. Just as we now understand the science of adversity, right, how ACEs lead to increased health problems, 
We also know that safe, stable, and nurturing relationships are healing. And when I say healing, I don't mean it just makes us feel better. I mean that, for example, when newborns got skin-to-skin -skin contact, nurturant care, right? What we found was they had improved stress reactivity, better functioning of their nervous system, better sleep patterns, and healthier maturation of the prefrontal cortex. And that these effects on cognitive and behavioral control were measured over the next 10 years. MRI studies of kids who were in institutionalized care, right? Kids who were in institutions. When they random, there was a randomized control trial that showed that for kids who were randomized into nurturant caregiving, right? And it's really sad that kids in the institutions need to have a randomized control trial to get nurturant caregiving, right? But the kids who were randomized into nurturant caregiving, what we found on MRI studies was that there was normalization of the developmental trajectory of the white matter of the brain after randomization. These kids were randomized at age two when they did uh, MRIs of their brains uh, at age eight. Their brains look like kids who had never been institutionalized. That is the power of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships. I know. It's pretty great. We also see that social support uh, improves the functioning of the immune system, right? And when, when they randomize folks into high levels of social support or kind of, you know, whatever they had before, those who had high levels of social support, they were actually protected against becoming infected when they were exposed to the flu virus. We see that therapeutic touch, including massage, is associated with reduced heart rate, reduced cortisol levels, reduced insulin levels, regulation of our hormonal system. And uh, any of you guys here of Michael Meany? For those of you who have read my book, you will have heard of Michael Meany. But this was a guy, a researcher at McGill University in Canada. What he did was he, he looked at this in rats. He looked at this in, in, in baby rats, rat pups. And uh, when he looked at them, he took these baby rats and he kind of stressed them out a little bit, right? And then he gave them back to his, their moms. And what they found was even in rats, some rats, right? Some of these rat moms, when they had their stressed out baby, they did lots of nurturant care, what they call licking and grooming. So they, you know, hugged them and snuggled them, the human equivalent of hugs and kisses. And some rat moms, eh, not so much, right? And they found that those baby rats whose moms did lots of nurturant caregiving, guess what? They performed better on cognitive tests. They had a healthy, more normally functioning uh, stress response that turned itself off more normally after the stressor was over. And they found that these changes in the, in the rat's uh, cognitive functioning and in their stress response was associated with changes in their epigenetic regulation, right? So it was actually somehow those baby rat, those, those mama rats, with their nurturant care, they were changing their rat pups' epigenetic regulation, changing the way their DNA was being uh, read and transcribed simply by their behavior, right? But then, Meany and his colleagues, he did something kind of crazy. And he took these rat pups, the next generation, oh, I almost forgot to say the best thing. The best thing, right, is that when these baby rats grew up, if they had this high level of nurturant caregiving, they became nurturant caregivers themselves. And then they did, so me and his colleagues did this crazy thing. He took the, the next generation of rat pups and he switched them at birth, right? These, uh, these pups from the low nurturing moms, he gave them to a high nurturing mom and vice versa. And guess what he found? He found the cognitive functioning, right? The functioning of the stress response and even the epigenetic regulation was that of the rearing mother, not of the genetic mother. Literally, that behavior 
of high levels of nurturing changed the way that the next generation of rat pups' DNA was read and transcribed. And when they got high levels of nurturant caregiving, not only was their brain uh, function changed and their stress response changed, their epigenetic markers were changed. And then when they grow up, grew up, they were high nurturers themselves. When we are talking about the power of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships, you guys, we are talking about the capacity to interrupt the intergenerational cycle of transmission of ACEs and trauma. So the moral of the story is, lick your pops. <laughs> And I'll tell you really briefly, in our clinic, what we did as a result is we began routinely screening every single child for adverse childhood experiences. And we did it in a way that was fast and easy. We actually didn't ask families to tell us which ACEs they'd experienced, only how many. So we wrote the list here. We also added some other things that we thought could also be risk factors for toxic stress. And we just said, just write the number in the box. And the reason is because that allows a medical provider to assess very quickly whether this is a child who's in need of additional resources, whether this is a child and family in need of additional resources. And what we saw, right, was that it changed our medical care, right? So I saw a little girl, almost three years old. She wasn't growing. She was itty bitty. Her mom was worried that she wasn't growing, right? And as a routine part of our care, I did an ACE screen, right? Her previous pediatrician had been giving her the number one treatment when a child is having poor growth or what we call failure to thrive, which is extra nutrition, nutritional supplementation, right? But it didn't seem to be working. It turns out for this almost three-year-old child, she had seven ACEs. And so, in addition to nutritional supplementation, I also prescribed child-parent psychotherapy so that the mom would help to learn about how to keep her child safe. I said, because of what your child has experienced, I believe that her body may be making more stress hormones than the average person. And so, I'm actually going to, I know it seems crazy, her, her problem is that she's, you know, struggling to grow but I'm actually going to um, refer you to a psychologist to help you develop the tools to provide a safe, stable, and nurturing relationship for your child. This is what that child's growth curve looked like when she first came to me, right? She was off the curve. Her height and weight had, was below the third percentile. And within six months, she was back on the growth curve. That is the power of understanding, doing early identification and early intervention for ACEs. Unfortunately, right now in the United States, right, of the 33,000 pediatricians that are part of the American Academy of Pediatrics, only 4% are screening for ACEs, right? That is something that absolutely has to change. And if we look at what's happening here in Scotland, right, Similarly, do, helping our first-line providers do this early identification and early intervention is absolutely critical. And when I saw that 4% number in the U.S., I was like, gosh, that's nuts. But it turns out only 11% had ever even heard of ACEs to begin with. And what does that tell us? It means that every single one of us in this room is part of the solution. Because step one is raising awareness, shouting it from the rooftops, right? And in our center, right, we developed a clinical protocol to help doctors figure out how to do this. We launched it. We were hoping maybe, you know, a couple, we would reach 1,000 people in three years. Within a year, over 1,500 providers in 23 countries had downloaded our protocol, and we've now developed a whole website uh, de dedicated to helping 
doctors understand how to identify ACEs. But if we think that we are going to solve this issue in the doctor's office, we're out of our minds, right? We know that when it comes to addressing ACEs and toxic stress, it is absolutely critical that every single sector, whether you're a police officer, or you're a judge, or an educator, or an early childhood specialist, or you're running a nursery, this is something that every single one of us needs to know, right? Because the revolution is in how each of us, even if it's just talking to a friend or a colleague, has the power to raise awareness and change practice. I want to give a brief example of how they did this in a school in San Francisco. They did this initiative called Quiet Time. And in The Deepest Well, in my book, one of the things we talk about are what are the interventions that we know make a difference, right? To be able to address the root cause, which we now know is an overactive stress response. And one of the, what I talk about is what the evidence shows, sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships. And so a group of folks got together in a school in San Francisco and said, hey, we're just going to try something out. And they developed something called this quiet time intervention, which was um, helping kids do a, a practice of mindfulness. And if they didn't want to do it, they could just read quietly or sit quietly. But the mindfulness was really designed to help kids be able to regulate their stress response because we now know that mindfulness and meditation actually helps to activate the part of the nervous system that counteracts the stress response. So it helps us in our ability to regulate and be calm. Now, what do you think happened? We saw these kids had improved quality in their sleep, improvement in their psychological state. We saw a reduction in school violence a substantial drop in the suspension rate, an increase in GPA, right, in kids' grades, reduction of the achievement gap. They saw integrated, uh, this is one of my favorite, integrated brain function, more, more holistic brain function in administrators and teachers over a four-month period, right? Very important. And, and what we now, and, and what I didn't show is that in educators' own level of psychological stress, they saw a dramatic drop in the rate of psychological stress among administrators and teachers. Because although we know that as adults, we have the capacity to buffer the stress of the children in our lives. In order to do that, we have to put our own oxygen mask on first. We have to practice self-care. And that was the interesting thing about what they did in the schools in San Francisco, right? Was they had everyone do it, the kids and the teachers. And frankly, I believe that an important part of the intervention was helping the educators, the folks in the school environment, understand how they can regulate their own stress response so that they can be a buffer to the children in their lives. Renowned psychiatrist Dr. Bruce Perry did some amazing work with some of the most traumatized children in the U.S. And after one particularly terrible situation, it was actually um, uh, a cult situation uh, in, in Waco, Texas, he was caring for the children after all of the adults in the situation had, had died in this awful standoff with the FBI. And what he found was that, you know, some of those kids were so traumatized, they weren't even, they weren't ready for therapy. But what he wrote in his book, a very powerful book, uh, called the, the Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, what he mentioned was, even if those kids weren't ready for therapy, 
every single adult in those kids' lives had the opportunity to provide therapeutic interactions, little therapeutic moments for these children. And those therapeutic moments were ultimately healing. I believe that every single one of us has the capacity to provide therapeutic moments for the young people in our lives. And, you know, me being a scientist and a doctor, of course, I think to myself, what does it look like for us as a society to maximize the cumulative dose of therapeutic moments? What if everyone from the bus driver to the lunch lady to the police officer to the, the guy who's, you know, checking out the groceries uh, at the grocery store knows, understands ACEs, and recognizes their role in providing little therapeutic moments for a young person that may be crossing their path. And if each one of us does just a little bit, we have the potential to provide profound healing for children. What does it look like to build a movement? It starts with sounding the alarm, right? Then, and one thing I'll say, you have to package the message to make sure that it can be working, right? So that you don't have to be. Because my husband and I have four kids, and uh, I, uh, as much as I love doing this work, it was really important to put this information into a TED Talk, into a book, into messages that other people can take forward, right? Because none of us can be everywhere. And as we do this work, we have to think about how we do it sustainably in ways that allow us to do our, our own self-care. Then we engage strategic champions and build networks. And that is how we build a movement. This is something that every single one of us can do. We don't have to wait for the members of parliament to pass something from on high to tell us that we are going to tackle ACEs in Scotland. We can begin with every single one of us doing something right now. And in our center, we even created a website called stresshealth.org to help parents and caregivers understand what they can do. And I'm going to, uh, I, I'm a little over time, uh, but I'm going to very quickly play a very short video um, that we produced, uh, and then I will, I will wrap up. just grew up, if I could just get through, I could leave all this behind. But that's not how it works. Everything that happened, it's still part of me. But there's hope. I learned how to heal from toxic stress and make sure the cycle ends with me. Learn more about toxic stress and how you can stop it at stresshealth.org.
All right, you guys. We have our marching orders. We recognize that ACEs are a public health crisis that is hidden in plain sight. And there is something that every single one of us can do. If you're in healthcare or you're an advocate, advocate for routine screening and supporting best practices as well as advancing the research and ACEs informed policies and practice. If you are a parent, a teacher, a caregiver, or anyone that touches a child's life, learn about the signs of an overactive stress response and what we can do to prevent or reverse the effects. Here in Scotland, the ACEs movement has begun. And you all are getting it right. It's about raising awareness, establishing routine inquiry, collecting data, consideration of ACEs in every situation, working across sectors, tackling parental and family risk factors, advancing the science, and building resilience. And here we are getting it right for every child. It's already established the National Trauma Training Framework to help Scotland's future workforce develop the skills and services to respond appropriately. The, the REACH program trains health visitors, school nurses, family support teams, substance misuse practitioners. The Scottish government has set out its commitment to preventing and mitigating ACEs and established in its vision and priorities for 2020 that ACEs are a key issue and prescribing actions to respond. This is long work. This is hard work. But I believe that the people in this room are all we need to create an ACE movement in Scotland. And as you all move forth, I just want you to encourage you to make sure that you, as you're going forth and doing this, are practicing self-care, that you take care of yourself and that you take care of each other. Because we have the power to transform ACEs and make Scotland the first ACE-aware nation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the movement. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris.